I think this is important also from the standpoint of, you know, there's a lot of offerings out there for sure. When you look at syndications there's, and there's different asset classes and there's different A, B, and C, and then there's self-storage and housing and office and everything else. So there's a lot of options out there. So I think it's important for any investor to kind of hone in on something and kind of get comfortable with something that they want to go after. Welcome to your daily real estate syndication show. My name is Dina Berg. Today, my guest is Dan Rowley, and Dan has had 30 years of professional experience in finance and business operation roles. He holds a position today of CFO and general manager for an online advertising network, where more than 10 years, he had oversight over all business operations, reporting directly to the private equity ownership group. Furthermore, Dan has actively been involved in real estate investment for over a dozen years, started like many of us in single family rental properties. Dan did it across five different states and currently holds a portfolio of 16 cash flowing rental properties, valued at over $4 million. Over the last several years, however, Dan has shifted focus to investments in private equity, syndications, and joint venture deals. He currently owns over $1.5 million in limited partner and private debt lender positions, and he is co-general partner on a 281-unit deal in Greenville, South Carolina. One thing I love about today's interview is Dan's particular focus on investing in identifying growth markets that exhibit favorable demographics, growth in population, income, and jobs. He's going to talk about that. I know you're going to enjoy it. So. Join me in today's show, Dan Rowley. Well, Dan, thank you so much for joining us. It was a pleasure to recently meet you in person in Salt Lake City, and I'm grateful that you're going to join us here on our show today. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me on the show. I appreciate it. Yeah, look forward to hearing what you have to share with us. Loved reading your bio. Why don't you give us just kind of a flyover of who you are? a summary of your professional career and then land us down at what you're in the midst of right now. And then we can ask questions along those lines as we proceed in the show. Sure. Okay. I have to start with, I live in North Carolina, Cary, with my wife and two kids, age 10 and eight. We moved here from California two and a half years ago during the pandemic. I know a lot of people moved during that time. We were within that group. Face um, to coast. Were you just tired of staying inside and you're like, maybe the East Coast, we can get outside? <laughs> Well, there was some of that. The move. There was some of that. And then the wildfires were a factor mm. and cutting our power and various, various other challenges there in Northern California. Um, so it just felt like a good time to make a change. And I think this is a very good like family environment that we found here in North Carolina. So we like it so far. From a professional standpoint, I've been in finance and business for about 30 years. Most recently, I'm the CFO and general manager or an advertising network, an online advertising network. And I've been doing that job for quite a while, about 13 years. I began to get involved in real estate investing about a dozen years ago. We started with acquiring some single family, family condo type rentals. And fortunately, we bought in at a good time right after the mortgage back situation and real estate really corrected. We got some good deals. And so our first Experiences in real estate investing were very positive, right? There's really good returns. They cash flowed from day one. And as we know, you know, real estate can pay you five ways. And we were kind of seeing that, right? The appreciation, the tax benefits, the cash flow. And so we did that for a number of years. We started building a rental portfolio. We were in California. And so we, we began to buy a lot of out-of-state rentals because California doesn't necessarily have the best rental real estate in certain certain circumstances. So we started Wait, to buy wait can I just interject before and say, like, tell me a little bit about that. What, how did you decide what state to buy in? You're just buying out of state and this is how you're launching into your real estate investment career. That's kind of a big leap. What did that look like and how did that unfold? Yeah, I think mainly we were seeing that the returns were constrained in California, especially as the value started to pop back up, right? And when things were covered in the housing market. So you couldn't really buy much that made a lot of sense it would pencil out the profit. So, and I started to research and look at other markets and, you know, there's a lot of, there's blogs and there's podcasts, et cetera, where you can learn about where they might be promising rentals. 
And my, my theory and tactic has mainly been around looking at data around growth markets. What are the areas that are, that are growing for both population growth, income growth, where are people moving to? Um, so I, I look at growing metros, look at good median incomes, but I like to look at a lot of data before I put any money into play. So, so I've been most focused on the sound belt, obviously, those are the, the areas that have picked up a lot of people and there's a lot of growth. Um, so I invested in Texas, Utah, Idaho, one or two others. But again, my approach has been somewhat data-driven, right? I don't want to invest in an area that's not growing in population because you might have a demand problem, right? Where you, mm -hmm. you have vacancies and so forth. So for me, the fundamentals seem pretty like intuitive, right? To find, find a market that's growing where there's a need for housing. Mm -hmm. I mean, we know that in the, in the country as a whole, there's a shortage of housing. Those numbers are debatable what they are, but... But in some regions, right, obviously there's more shortage than others. And where there's a, a growing population, there's, there's bound to be a shortage, right? And so that you're in a better position as a landlord if you've got high demand in your market, right? Sure. What are your favorite um, analysis tools for population growth? Uh, well, I mean, the, pop the census data is pretty readily available through Google searches or city data has a lot of good information on crime and poverty rates and median home prices and all these things. You can get some of the high level info from Zillow too, in terms of vacancy and the, the median home income and medium home prices over a period of time. So I use a variety of sources for that. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you, you found your markets, you execute, pull the trigger. How many markets were you in and how long did that take you? I think over a period of about uh, from 2012 to 2019, maybe seven years. Mm -hmm. We're in about five markets and, you know, we'd experienced some good returns and so I'd say some success, mm -hmm. right. In terms of net worth was definitely growing because of the real estate. Mm -hmm. um, but I think at some point I realized that when you're buying individually, you, you're kind of limited in, in your scale, right? So there's a number of things you got to kind of take care of insurance, property management relationships, you got to do your taxes. So when you own all these individually, there's a certain amount of work. It's not entirely passive. Mm -hmm. So I, I started to question scalability. And so that's when we realized that maybe there's a better route to take still within real estate, right? To, to be able to scale. And that's when I got interested and started to investing in syndications about maybe 2019-ish. Mm -hmm. Okay. So how did you find syndications from the single family home rental ownership platform across states, by the way? I mean, that seems like a significant risk, but you seem to be pretty sheltered in like data driven proof, which is a huge ask. It's a huge benefit when you're taking risks to, to at least have them measured. So when you were thinking about scaling and you're thinking, man, I can only do so much property management. How did you find out about multifamily syndication, passive investment? And then where did you go from there? Yeah, I think I can't actually remember the exact point where I learned about the syndications, but I was attending some of the local meetups in the San Francisco Bay area. And I think some of the guests that came in were, were involved in syndications. Mm -hmm. And I started to plug in some of the podcasts that are out there, the Joe Fairless podcast, mm -hmm. eventually Whitney's podcast. Yeah. There's a bunch of others, right? And then I started to kind of like get into what syndications are and learn the ins and outs of them. And then doing my own independent research, right? So I can't tell you exactly when I found out about it, but it was, it didn't seem like a much of a departure from what I was doing. In terms of real estate investing, it was just kind of a different, different method, right? And so it, it resonated with me. And Where so you can be a passive, compare... you can be a passive partner and still reap all the benefits, right? Of you know, some cash flow, some appreciation, some tax benefits, right? So I liked that. Yeah. I mean, if you were to compare your return on equity side by side with all these individual single family homes versus scaling with your multifamily investment, how would you say they compare? Well, I would say they're comparable, I think, but a lot of it is good horse timing, right? When you get into a market and how much it's gone up. And I would say that the last 10 to 12 years has not been probably the most realistic period of time to evaluate because it's been kind of a Goldilocks economy, right? There's been loose money by the Fed. There's been definitely spending by the government. It's been the asset bubble, right? Everything's gone up. So it's possible to have failed in real estate over the last 10 years, but it, it's a lot more difficult than it would have been in some other time periods, right? But I would say in general, had some really good gains on rental properties that we bought early on. They doubled the value. 
because of the housing recovery. But I've also had syndication experiences within the last two years, right? Where if you bought something three years ago, it sold you. Last year, I was seeing a couple of deals exit with doubling my money in two years. That wasn't uncommon in syndications. Mm -hmm. And there's a bunch of other deals that, that are in fair stages, right? That I'm still holding that haven't exited, but they're doing fine. A couple maybe with the current interest rates or they cost distribution. So that the experience is all over the map. But in general, I have not lost money, let's say. So far, but it could happen on realist. And that's why I think diversification is important, right? Getting into different markets with different operators and kind of spreading your money so that, you know, if something doesn't go wrong, it's, it's just some portion of your, of your, of your portfolio that, that's at yeah. risk, right? So did it feel risky at all for you going from full control, hands-on management with single family into being a totally limited partner and a passive investor? Or was that a delight? Well, I would say the first time I sent out the wire to fund, I was, it was, I wasn't quite sure. It was the first time I'd done that. And you're, you're trusting people, right? You're hoping that they don't run out for the money. But I think that's why the due diligence is important, right? You got to kind of see what the track record is, get, talk to references, make sure that they're operators that are trustworthy. And there's no perfect process for that. And I think early on, I, my process probably wasn't nearly as thorough as it is now because I didn't know what I didn't know. But Fortunately, I got involved early on, I think, with some good operators that had, you know, good ethics, good understanding of what they were doing. They provided good returns, and that helped solidify for me that this can be a good vehicle for, for investing, right? So, um, but it was a little bit maybe nerve-wracking the very first time I sent out a wire because, you're, you're, again, you're, your money is going to be capped, and you're not in control anymore, right? Right. And not everybody who's in the passive investing space has the benefit of being a CFO. So let's talk about what skills and competencies that you have found to be valuable in real estate investing and that can be transferable for folks, let's say, who might not be in your professional background with the level of experience in financial matters as you have. Well, I would say that I'm very comfortable, right, diving into numbers and spreadsheets and underwriting, right, kind of validating projections that these groups are putting out. And I've um, been known to ask a certain number of questions about it. Um, and if I can get a hold of their underwriting, grant, then I can kind of pick it apart and do my own sensitivity analysis. So part of it's the numbers, part of it's the credibility, the story and the market and what, what their business plan is, right? So it's a combination of those things. But I think also the financial analysis piece I'm very comfortable with, but also having owned my own real estate, right? I mean, I wasn't, this wasn't my first time investing in real estate. So I kind of understood the dynamics, you know, the importance of property management, mm -hmm. kind of how things worked behind the scenes, right? How you, how you manage assets effectively. So I think it was less of a, <clears throat> I guess, stretch to get into, you know, this because I'd already been involved in real estate on my own. So I kind of understood the fundamentals of it, right? Mm -hmm. If that makes sense. So when you're looking at, let's say someone sends you their <laughs> underwriting, what, give me an example, if you can think of one where you're a red flag pops up in your mind and you're like, no way. What are the kind of things that give you the most pause? Well, certainly if the expected rental increases are too high, that, that'd be a question mark, right? How, how, they, how are they supporting that, right? You don't want to be too aggressive in that. Of course, there has been very high rent increases in reality for the last few years, but I don't, I don't think people really expect that to continue. That was kind of an anomaly. With inflation, you would expect some, but so anyway, a rental increase that's too high, right? It's assumed or comps, if you're looking at comps and there's some of the comps, maybe aren't the same asset type, maybe they're better assets. So then that inflates what they, what they hope to gain in, in rent. Certainly an exit cap assumption, right? Is a key one that I look at. Um, and that has to be kind of defensible, right? I can't give you a certain number of what's good or bad, but you know, you, you typically want an exit cap that's expanded from where you're currently at. And, you know, that it's, it's reasonable to think in five years, what's a conservative exit cap. You don't, you want to think too aggressive because mm -hmm. yeah, that may not be where the market's at when you're ready to sell, right? So is it going to be seller's market or buyer's market? So exit cap rates, probably one of the biggest ones that can easily swing numbers in one direction, right? In terms of like projected returns. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, there's also vacancy and various other things that you would want to make sure aggressors, you know, assumptions aren't too aggressive. Mm -hmm. And since you have a lot of background in market analysis, how closely would you align those numbers with the specific market? Let's just say rent increase, for example. 
How dependent on the market is that number? Or would you say it should be more across the board? I think there's a component of that that's, that's market driven for sure. And there's a component that's, you know, the business plan. If you're significantly adding value, right, and improving units, uh, you're, you're going to see a rent bump, right? So it's a matter of buying into what they're planning to do. And, but also looking at the median incomes of the area, right? If, you, if you're planning to raise around 20%, but the median income in that area and the demographics wouldn't necessarily support that because again, you got to look at the income to rent ratio that people can afford, then, then that would be that slide too, right? So you got to look at whatever people are going to be able to afford within that submarket, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, good. You mentioned before your fundamental belief in diversification and whether it's with operators, whether it's asset class. Can you talk to us a little bit about your general investing philosophy? As you've grown, you've entered into single family, you've moved into multifamily. Talk to us about your investing philosophy. Sure. And I think this is important also from the standpoint of, you know, there's a lot of offerings out there for sure. When you look at syndications there's, and there's different asset classes and there's different A, B, and C, and then there's self-storage, housing, office, and everything else. So there's a lot of options out there. So I think it's important for any investor to kind of hone in on something and kind of get comfortable with something that they want to go after, right? So for my, my own philosophy, I'm kind of more of a value investor, let's say. And this goes, this kind of crosses over into kind of the equity markets, right? You got value stocks and you got growth stocks, right? And, uh, you know, I'm a follower of like Warren Buffett's philosophy. He likes to invest in businesses that make money, right? And they're not as speculative. So I'm the same way. I don't want to invest in too much that's speculative. I'd rather invest in something that's you know, produces profit or can certainly produce profit in the near future. And it's got intrinsic value to it. So I think for me, real estate has kind of fit right into that kind of mindset. So just going back to equity markets again, I do still invest in the equity markets, but I've certainly shifted a lot of my portfolio from equities to real estate. But when I'm looking at things in the stock market, so I pay attention to some of the fundamentals like PE ratio, right? Price per earnings ratio, um, which kind of shows what, what something is valued at against their earnings, right? And that's similar to a cap rate dynamic, right? In real estate. So my point being here is that Maybe an example I could cite would be, you know, Tesla right now, they have a PE ratio of 55, which is a very high PE ratio, which means the company's market value is really high compared to its earnings versus a Ford or a GM and their PE ratios are probably around five or 10, right? So I'd be more likely to invest right now in Ford GM than I would Tesla. And that's not to knock Tesla through a company, they're a pioneer. They made a lot of money for people, but if I were to, Think about where to put my money today, it would be Tesla, it would be Ford or GM, right? Just mm -hmm. because of, I think there's a lot more downside than upside, right? And so like last year, for instance, I had a lot of money in Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway, right? And so last year, 2022, that stock went up 4%, I think, while the S&P and the NASDAQ both went down 20 to 30%, right? So that just validates for me that if you're in kind of more value-oriented investments, uh, you, you're probably less likely to see all the fluctuations, the volatility. That's a lot of reasons why I moved some of the money out of the stock market. It's very volatile. You don't feel like you're in control. I think that there's other value type investments outside equities that make sense, like real estate. So, so I'm more of a value investor and I don't need home runs necessarily. They're nice if you get them, but I'm, I'm okay with singles and doubles, right? Base hits. And I don't need to double my money in two years. I'm, I'm fine doubling my money in five years. And that's what a typical real estate investment that's solid audit maybe potentially produce, right? And I'm okay with that. You got to have some, if I have a little more patience, I'm not looking for the kind of immediate, you know, home run. Mm -hmm. And so I've shied away from, so, so again, I guess my, my philosophy is rather value oriented and I think real estate kind of sits in very well with that. Um, I think the other thing is to kind of resist kind of shiny object syndrome, right? Because there's a lot of noise out there. There's a lot of alternative investments and even more that has kind of crept up over the last few years, right? I mean, you got crypto, you got NFTs, you got SPACs, you got Robinhood, the ability to day trade based on Reddit memes and all these different things, right? And I think a lot of people hope to kind of make a lot of money very quickly overnight. But to me, that's more gambling and that's more speculation. And that's not true investing. So I 
I tend to shy away from that and kind of focus more on st- more boring investments like real estate. And boring could be a good thing. And again, I'm not knocking anybody else's strategy, but I think as an investor, it's important to kind of like find your lane, kind of mm-hmm. stay within it, see what you're comfortable with. So I'm a little bit more conservative, I think, by nature. I'm willing to let time, you know, kind of like play out. And I don't need a, this kind of immediate life-changing thing because it's oftentimes not going to be there. It might be a mirage, right? And so I think uh, kind of picking what you're comfortable with based on your philosophy and mine is more value oriented in real estate. I think sits very well into that. I'm willing to take time and, and to hold investments over a longer period of time. And I think over the long haul, real estate's proven to be a pretty, pretty good investment, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you got into multifamily, you said in 2019, is that correct? Yeah. Through, in terms of syndications, yes. Mm-hmm. Okay. What have you, what have you perceived as the, I mean, a lot has changed in the last six to 12 months from where we've been per your Goldilocks comment. What are some of the biggest changes that you've seen with the different operators who you're in communication with? Well, certainly there hasn't been as much deal flow and it makes sense, right? It's been difficult to find deals that make sense to buy given the high debt costs. And I think the seller and buyer expectations have been kind of in different places. There's been this gap. Um, and I've gotten a little more active myself in syndication. So I, with my partners, I've been looking at deals and it's been clearly the case that there hasn't been a lot of deals that make a whole lot of sense. I mean, you know, I don't want to stretch the numbers too much to be too optimistic. So we, we've held off on a number of deals. It just didn't make sense. So I think that's one of the clear dynamics, right? That it's harder to find deals. I mean, a seller wouldn't necessarily want to sell now because it's a down market unless they had to sell. Maybe you're, you needed to, you know, free up their money or something. So there hasn't been nearly as many deals out there. And it's been a lot more difficult with the, the debt, current debt rates, right? To make, make things pencil out and especially to get cash flow, right? Mm-hmm. Right. So tell me a little bit about your family. Is your wife involved in investing? Is she interested in learning about it? Do you have kids? Tell me what you like to do as a family and how that overlaps with your professional life. Yeah, I would say my wife is interested, but not that involved. So she kind of leaves it to me. Uh, But she had, when we started buying our first rental property, she definitely on board. She helped with that process and helped contribute capital for that process. And we both you'll see that it's really over the results. But in terms of the day-to-day, what I'm looking at and so forth, I don't involve her tremendously, but I would be willing to share with her any anytime she wants. Mm-hmm. So it's mainly me in terms of the nuts and bolts. I have two girls, 10 and eight. We're trying to get them involved in various activities. And so I think the work-life balance that I've been able to achieve more recently has been important because well, I want to spend time with them in their formative years, right? Mm-hmm. I don't want to be working all the time. I would say that there have been points in my career many years ago where I was working a lot more. I didn't have kids at the time, 60 hour work weeks, whatever. And at that point, that was, that was fine, but I wouldn't want to do that again because I would miss out on a lot, I think, in terms of their formative years of development. So we're trying to get them involved in various things, music, athletics, academics. So we don't know exactly what they're going to kind of latch on to. We, we have some ideas, but right now it's just kind of getting involved, involved in various things and doing things with them. And, just enjoying this period of time because it's pretty, it's hard one to have two girls. I grew up in a family with mostly boys. So this is kind of foreign to me oh, and God. it's priceless to have two young girls. And so I don't want to miss out on too much. So that's a little bit about my family. And what How do you doing. maintain so we, that work-life balance? You, you've gone from 60 hours a week to understanding. Thank God, you know, that you understand how precious this time is. What do you, what kind of practical barriers, I guess, do you put into place to protect that time with your family? Yeah, I would say that I'm fortunate and blessed in many ways because my day job hasn't been super time demanding as it used to be. And so, and that's been a good thing. I think if it had started to be more demanding, again, I probably would would be doing something else. I wouldn't be doing the day job anymore. So it's provided me a work-life balance that's very, very favorable that I didn't necessarily have before. And so, sorry, there's a lawn more in my neighbor's yard. (laughs) That doesn't come through so I'd say I'll continue to work as long as it doesn't interfere too much with my family, because at that point I would just be able to give up the day job, right? Because a lot of these investments have been yielded really good streams of income, right? But I, I still, I think also have the kind of personality, I, I need to kind of be busy and occupied and get up in the morning and have some objectives and things to do. So 
having some work and some day-to-day responsibilities, I think, and structure, let's say, is still important to me. If I were retired tomorrow, I would have to kind of figure out a lot more things to occupy my time. And I'll, I'll do that at some stage, but I'm still okay with doing the day job as long as it doesn't you know, take over my life. And right now it hasn't necessarily taken over my life. So I've been blessed in that regard. Man, you just described something that you and I spoke with briefly before the show started. <laughs> I feel like when summer break starts every year, kids have to experience early retirement. Like the bottom just falls out on their daily structure. <laughs> they have an identity crisis. <laughs> we're in the midst of that transition yeah. right now. So when you were describing that, I was like, wow, that's unfolding in our house as we speak. Yeah, this is true. And I think if there is a, a parallel. And I, I'm, I've heard about people that have retired and then they just don't know really what to do. They've got too, they have too much time. So I'll yeah. probably be one more to kind of ease in to a retirement. And I want to keep myself busy and intellectually challenged, right? Let's say. Yeah, well, let's talk about that. So often folks talk about their bigger why, especially folks who are really um, involved with passive investing because they want to create passive income, ongoing ability to generate income with having more freedom of time. So what, what do you think of when you think of the bigger why? What does your family think about? Share your thoughts on that. Yes, yeah, good question. I think, for, number one, I guess I feel pretty good about the value proposition as well that real estate offers. That's another reason I like it. I think, you know, as owners of real estate, we have a responsibility, I think, to kind of provide playing safe, affordable housing for people. And because we do that, hopefully there's some profit involved. Of course, we do have a number of tax advantages, right, that the government gives us because they can't possibly provide all the housing to people that, that, that's needed, right? So I think I feel good about that value proposition. And it's not a superfluous kind of thing that you're selling or marketing to people. It's a basic need, right? It's shelter. And so I think the value proposition resonates with me as well. And in terms of um, my why, I think that, you know, I've been blessed with a lot of resources. And I want to be a good steward of those resources. So we have a number of charities we regularly contribute to in our church. And I think taking care of family and then where we can help out elsewhere is, is also something that it feels good, right? And I think we want to expand those opportunities as well. And I think LifeBridge, one of the reasons I really have a positive view of them, right, is they, they, they definitely are very involved. A lot of profits go into the adoption support and they have a why that is that they really back up and, and are able to provide a for a cause that they believe in. I said, and I don't have that specific cause maybe yet, mm-hmm. but I think I have a number of other chair, smaller charities that we've been involved in for a number of years that we want to continue to support mm-hmm. and, and get more involved in free and try to help people to the extent we can, right? Oh, that's great. That's great. So wrapping things up, this has been a really great interview. I loved your thoughts on underwriting. Uh, and market analysis, what do you have any parting, parting, your parting shot, parting advice for other passive investors or people who are even already on this journey? What, what have you benefited from the most? Or what do you recommend that folks do when they're engaging in investment with multifamily or real estate um, in general? It doesn't yeah, have yeah, yeah. to be multifamily. I think it may, again, a big part of it is, is to kind of identify your investing philosophy and find something that fits that. Again, even within real estate and multifamily, to some degree, there's different asset types and asset classes you can get involved in. You might have stronger opinions on class A, class B, class C, you know, workforce housing, but find something that you, you feel good about from the value proposition standpoint. And I think, again, another thing I didn't mention earlier was experience, right? I think Everybody has different experiences coming in, right? So I had, before I was investing in syndications, I had experience as a rental property owner. So real estate experience. And then additionally, just experience over 30 years of following markets, being involved in business and finance, being a CFO for the last 13 years. All these experiences have helped me to maybe just hone in on things that make sense for me. Um, so everybody's experience is going to be very different. Somebody with an engineering background or an artistic background, they're going to have maybe very different philosophies or investing outcomes in myself, but I'd say find something that your experience is a good fit for. I think uh, perspective, right? I, I think you can't, I think the experience is helpful for me because you, you know, you just don't know what you don't know. If I was 30 years old and had only been investing for the last 10 or 12 years, let's say, um, 
I might, again, think that this Goldilocks economy is just the way things always work, but that's, I know that that's not reality because I lived through much more, right? I was working and involved in finance during the dot-com crash. I was doing things during the uh, 08, 09 Great Recession. My first mortgage on property that I bought in the mid-1990s is, is 6 or 7%. So that's not a wildly crazy number. That we're seeing those interest rates again. And that doesn't phase me that big much because by historical standards, that is, is not a super high interest rate still, right? And I do believe that things got kind of distorted when cost of capital went down to such a low rate as it was. So I think a lot of investments were going into things that maybe didn't have a great value proposition, but there was a lot of money out there to be invested, right? So again, I think experience, everybody's different experiences are going to come into play in terms of how they get involved in investing and what they choose to kind of focus on. But I know that'd be my party shot. So figure out from your own experiences, kind of what makes sense to you, kind of find a philosophy that you kind of apply and, you know, find a niche that makes sense to you and kind of like maybe focus on it versus jumping too, too much all over the place because there is a lot of noise out there and a lot of different investments that are being thrown out as promising, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. That's good. I you kind of remind me of a study like the waves kind of a guy. I love your your market background and encouragement to look at underwriting and to compare that with average household incomes. Just reviewing some of the things that you commented on, I think are really helpful and applicative, applicable. So thank you for that. Thank you for being here on the show today and wish you the best. Thanks for having me on. I really appreciate your time. Thanks again for joining us today for the Daily Real Estate Syndication Show. Again, this is your host, Dina Burr. Don't forget to like and subscribe our show. Have a blessed day.